Tell you what, I'm watching that video I kind of got a little emotional because God's done a great thing. And uh, it all started uh, for a few of us uh, not knowing exactly where the Lord wanted us. And uh, prayed, prayed about uh, for a couple of months where God wanted me. And uh, <clears throat> it wasn't about a month uh, after I prayed that, I got a call from Terry Sontag uh, saying they were thinking about starting a fellowship. Would you be interested in meeting uh, together in our our uh, garage to talk about it? And I said, well, I, I, I suppose uh, God led me a different direction that I was currently going. And I already knew that and I already had a date in my mind and it was just two two weeks after the date that I knew that I was supposed to be doing something else. So I think God had directed uh, for me this path. And so we, we met with a couple of families uh, in, in a garage and uh, I think uh, Randy was there as well and uh, a few other people that are in this room. And we met together and decided we would try to get together and start a little fellowship. And we started uh, a Bible study. And then we met our first Sunday uh, in Ryan and Ashley's trailer home down South Water. That was our first Sunday, and I think we had somewhere around 20, 22, I think, on our first Sunday. And uh, we knew the Lord had put something special together. Uh, the next week, uh, I told Randy, I said, you know, we probably really need to get something, you know, well, we were talking about having something else, getting something that we could meet in, uh, not having to meet in someone's home. And, and we thought of uh, Frank, uh, Placuda uh, talked to him about renting the uh, fellowship, uh, not fellowship, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. the community center at the field store. And so we, we sat and talked to him a couple of times. Uh, I think Randy finally made the cut with him, <laughs> the deal with him, but it was $100 a week. We just could not believe that God could give us a place to worship and have fellowship and a kitchen. Hundred bucks a week uh, on a Sunday, and we knew that it was from God. And we started meeting there, and we started growing, and uh, we celebrated our one-year anniversary there. And, and uh, I think we had around 65 at our one-year anniversary. Uh, it was just a blessing. We had Brother Johnny Tucker there several times, and he's with us today. And we, I tell you what, God just touched our 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 little church and that we thought that was this my little church. And uh, two months into our, our fellowship, we called Brother Randy as our pastor. And I'll tell you, um, if God wasn't uh, anointed that, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> Randy was fit for the, for the challenge and was armed and ready and had his, had his uh, armor on. And he was ready for the challenge. And he stepped up in a big way. And this is the reason why we're in this building today is because of Randy and his family and uh, their leadership and, and striving forward and looking and having, having a vision of what this church could be. Uh, and I've always been taught that, that you had to have a vision in your church to grow. And once that vision is gone uh, and you don't have a vision, then your church will dwindle. And uh, Randy realized that. He realized that we need to focus on uh, our youth and our families try to strong, uh, to uh, strengthen our families and grow together. And uh, he has really uh, put forth a, a good, violent effort in, in raising this church. And uh, I just want to thank you, Randy, for, for stepping up and uh, calling to the Lord. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> a little, little over, let's see, I would say seven months ago, about seven months ago, we started really praying about a place uh, that the Lord we could call home that we wouldn't be it would be ours and we wouldn't have to set up tables. That a long story about renting a place that's a community center. Uh, uh, I don't know if you, you know that there's quite a few people that have weddings and so forth, and and sometimes it's kind of nasty when you get up there on Sunday morning to set up. We've had kegs of beer in the middle of the floor with beer all over the floors and stuff when we show up Sunday morning. Uh, so we'd have to clean that up and 
again, Randy and his family did a lot of that cleaning up. Mainly Randy. Mainly Randy. <laughs> Randy was early riser. He was already up there for us. But uh, uh, he would get it cleaned up and get it ready for church. It smelled like alcohol sometimes when we had church. <laughs> but uh, we had church. And uh, that was amazing. We started looking for a, a place of our own. And uh, we looked at a couple of places and it just wasn't really fit. And we kept driving this place. And I said, man, that would be a good place for a church. But none of us thought it was in reach. You know, we talked to the guy about this place, and he asked, and we it told us how much it was, and he was won't ask us for a place. And we said, oh, there's just no way. <laughs> there's no way that we could come up with a half a million dollars, you know. There's no way a little church could do something like that. So we sort of talked to him maybe about leasing it or lease to purchase, and he was very interested in talking to us about that. And we came up with a figure about how much the church could uh, come up with, uh, on a monthly basis, and we, he told us to get back with him and see what, how much we could afford. And so we came up with a number and gave him that number. He said, oh, that's too much. Oh, yeah. He said, I think we can get less, about $300 less than that a month. And then uh, down the road, you know, while we were negotiating that, we were at Volunteer Christian Builders, uh, my family, in the summer. And here we were just talking about leasing this place uh, when we left. And uh, I started talking to Lonnie, our crew chief, uh, and I said, you know, Dad couldn't come this year because of his health to our job site up there in, in, uh, near Dallas. And uh, I told him, I said, you know, Dad, this is his 40th year before this project. We really need to do something for him. You know, let's see if we can do something in the area that's close by where Dad can be uh, participate in his 40th year. And. Uh, you know, we started talking about it. I said, you know what, our church will probably be about ready about the time October come around for something, you know. And we started, Lonnie and I talked about it. I said, there's a place that we're talking to them about right now that I know it's this guy, rooms all in it. We're going to have to knock some rooms out. This is all offices in here. And I said, there's, you know, it's only a 16 foot hallway in it, and there's no way we can have church in that little hallway. And, uh, but I think Father Christian Brothers will be able to, to uh, open it up. And, uh, and he said, well, let's just go ahead and plan that. Let's go ahead and plan on October the 20th. That's when I'm going to be down. Let's do it October the 20th. I said, well, we haven't even got a lease. We haven't even done any paperwork yet. And so uh, I kept telling them, well, we're ready on October the 20th. And, uh, and, and, and the owner had some, some, uh, some stuff he had to go through as far as uh, legal battles uh, in order to have this place. And, and uh, I still had faith that we were going to do it October 20th. <laughs> but I don't think Randy, and, uh, Randy had the faith that it's going to happen. But man, we were at the last minute. We finally got the deal settled out Friday, the day before the builders came. <laughs> and, uh, and they showed up. And you see, two and a half days worth of work. Uh, this was all sheetrock, opened up and sheetrocked in two and a half days. And, uh, and uh, God has just been good. He's grown this, this body. Uh, he's grown us in, in spirit, which is the most important thing. Uh, it's to grow together. It's, it's been a, a, a phenomenal thing. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of history. And uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, Randy, I can turn it over to you. <laughs> Still passing around the offering plate, but I just want to, I'm not going to keep you long. Uh, I want to give Brother Johnny plenty of time uh, this morning. Uh, Miss Judy tells me that he can be pretty winded at times. So. <laughs> no, we, we, we love Brother Johnny and Miss Judy to death, and they've been such a blessing to us and throughout the years, not only in this ministry, but in the past, as, as many years as we've known them been an encouragement to us. And, uh, Brother Johnny has been a true example for myself of what it means to be a servant of the Lord. Uh, his commitment, his drive, his enthusiasm, and even in the, in, with his health issues, he has remained faithful in his calling and uh, has just been a true example uh, for me and for everyone involved. But we just want to thank him for being here with us this morning. Uh, Nikki and I went to a pastor's conference this past Thursday in Houston, and uh, 
uh, Dr. Tony Evans was the speaker there. And uh, he said something, he told a story um, that really, I guess, got my attention. He told a story of a young, young man and a young woman who had just been married, and they were on the road, on their way to um, uh, their honeymoon. And during uh, the drive there, it was foggy and the roads were wet. And the, the husband veered over to pass a truck and didn't realize there was a car coming. And this car met him head on and he swerved to get out of the way and ran into the ditch and turned the car over several times. And when he came to, he looked over and he saw his wife who was bleeding profusely. And he knew that if he didn't get her to a, to a hospital or to a doctor soon that she would bleed to death. And he said he looked up and all of a sudden he saw this sign and the sign said, uh, the practice of Dr. Jones, and it pointed to an office. So he grabs his wife <coughs> quickly and cradles her up in his arms, and he and he runs to the to the doctor's office, and he beats on the door, and he beats on the door. Finally, the doctor comes to the door, and he says, "How can I help you?" He's holding his wife, and he says, "Sir, I need you to save my wife. I need you to help my wife." And the doctor's reply to him was, "I'm sorry, son. I can't help you." I'm not practicing anymore. And the young man said to the doctor, he said, you have two choices. You either save my wife or you take down your son. It was an illustration to all of us ministers of the importance that we have of practicing what we preach and doing what we're advertising. We're advertising for the church, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that needs to be the, what, what we're doing. It needs to be what, we're, what our focus is, our main drive. We need to be a, uh, a place of refuge for people. We need to, play, need to be a place of hope, a beacon in the, in the darkness, a light in the dark. We need to be more than just performing our ritual duties here on a Sunday morning. It needs to be more than that. We need to be practicing. And if not, we need to take down our signs and move on. We are called to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and Paul tells us over in Romans chapter 1, when he's speaking to the, to the Roman church there, he, he, makes a, he makes a claim. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation. He says first for the, Gen for the Jew and then also for the Gentile. So we have a message. We've been entrusted with a message. That message is salvation through faith in Jesus Christ by grace alone. And if we're living that, if we're proclaiming that, then listen, that's the power there. Okay? The power isn't within us. We're just the messengers, but the power is in the message. Our duty, our obligations as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, is that we proclaim that gospel. In its truth and entirety. And let God do the work. He'll do the rest. Now today we're, uh, we're dedicating this building here to the Lord. I want to read to you a passage of Scripture over in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 6. Starting with verse 18. This is after Solomon gets through building the temple to the, of, of the Lord. And now this is his prayer of dedication. And I'm not going to read you the whole prayer. It consists of the whole chapter of chapter 6. I just want to read to you a portion of it. And starting with verse 18, Solomon's praying to the Lord. And he says, But will God indeed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple which I have built. So I want you to know that our purpose in purchasing this building and moving in here is not to contain God. Okay? It's not to hold God into ourselves here in this little bitty room. And, and uh, who, we all know that's impossible, right? I mean, we cannot contain God behind four walls. But my prayer and the prayer of this church is that God's presence would be here with us every time we assemble together. That we seek Him first. That we, that we know that this is a place of refuge. That we can come and lay down our burdens to the Lord and know that He is faithful. 
to know that we can confess our sins to the Lord. And, and I want to read just a little bit further here that Paul, I mean, uh, Solomon says, starting with verse 19, he says, Yet regard, regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication. O Lord my God, and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you, that your eyes may be open toward this temple day and night, toward the, the place where you said you would uh, put your name, that you may hear the prayer which your servant makes towards this place. And then in verse 21 he says, And may you hear the supplications of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place, hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. <clears throat> this building, this church building, can never ever expect to contain God here. But what we can expect is that we can meet God here. Every Sunday when we come together and we fellowship with one another, we can come with the expectation that, that God's going to be involved in this. And knowing that, listen, that our prayers are getting heard. Okay? And they'll be answered according to God's will. God's will is always better than ours. Amen? We have to put God first. So in this day of dedication to this building, we're not dedicating... We're not dedicating just this building. We're dedicating our lives to the Lord. In true, genuine service to the Lord. So later on when we say our prayer of dedication, it's going to be that we're giving this building to the Lord absolutely, but we're giving our lives to the Lord. With the expectation that God can and will use us to glorify Himself and to build His kingdom. Amen. Amen. I want to call Brother Johnny to the up front here. And uh, just to give you a little bit, so most of you I know know Brother Johnny and Miss Judy, but Brother Johnny is an evangelist from, um, from Centronelle, Alabama. And uh, so they've had to travel a good distance to get here, and uh, we're so grateful for that. Uh, Brother Johnny has been in the ministry uh, since he was 17 years old. Um, is that more than 50 years, Brother Johnny? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 52 years. 52. Uh, 15. 15. 15. Uh, but he is also the president of IMA, International Missions Association, with, which is a great, great ministry. Uh, my, me and my kids and uh, in-laws and my wife, we've all had the opportunity to be involved in that in some way. And it's been a huge blessing for us. And I've experienced some of, some of my most spiritual growth on those, on those trips. And it's been a blessing to us. Uh, but I want to bring Brother Johnny forward. Here's, he's got a message for us today. And uh, I know we'll be blessed. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Randy. <clears throat> I am 67. I'm not as old as my hair looks. <laughs> Here's some newsletters. Get one, if you will, before you leave today. <clears throat> I want to say a couple of words about uh, what we've been seeing. What a delight to have watched you uh, take a building and make it what we say is a church, but we know this is not the church. The church is here, but we're meeting in this building. But the Lord said this, this is an important issue. Really is. And I want to say a couple of things before I uh, preach a message, okay? Don't take Brother Randy and his family for granted. Very seldom do churches realize the impact the pastors have. Uh, I've been preaching for 52 years. I've literally preached to tens of thousands of pastors. And uh, <clears throat> I, I am what you call a full-time preacher. Uh, but Paul made tents like Brother Randy does. And he wrote most of the New Testament. Paul wrote back to the church at Philippi and he said, I had ministered where churches didn't take care of me and you took care of me. It is your responsibility to see to it that Brother Randy's needs are met. You say, well, he works. I commended his boss for letting him be flexible in doing mission trips and pastoring the church. But don't take for granted that Brother Randy has two full-time jobs. Did you hear what I said? Not one and a half, two. Don't take that for granted. Don't forget that. 
And if you pray for your pastor, double up your praying. And you say, God, most preachers sit behind a computer or sit at a desk. Brother Randy is earning a living. And wow, don't take that for granted. Can I say this to you? Most churches who have bivocational pastors do that. Did you hear me? Don't, don't let that happen to you. Then another thing. Though this is very unique and rare, it is not unique and rare. You are one of thousands of churches who have been right where you are. Exciting, thrilling, stimulating, wonderful movement where you have seen a building turn into a church building. And people are excited. Most of the time, most of the people begin to let that excitement and thrill subside. You know when you got married? The guy after 20 years said, she said, honey, you don't ever tell me you love me anymore. He said, well, I told you the day I married you, I love you. And if I ever quit, I'll tell you. You'll be the first to know. <laughs> now, isn't it rare? Judy and I will be celebrating our 50th anniversary soon. Uh, am I supposed to be less loving to her and less sensitive to her than I was when I was an 18-year-old young man when I married her? How absurd. Don't <laughs> let what God is doing with you get old. Don't let that happen to you. I want to commend this church family. If you're this one, let me tell you about this church. While they didn't have a place to meet, while they were tickled to death to pay $100 a week to have a place to worship, they were sending people all over the world to preach the gospel to Guatemala many times. This church raised 8,000 bucks to send three guys to the Philippines to preach to Muslims. You may not know that, but while they were there, over 5,000 public professions of faith. You ever heard of such? This church, while you were in the process of not even having a place to call your own, you sent somebody to preach the gospel around the world. Brother Randy, don't stop doing that. I'm not talking behind First Baptist. I've said this in the pulpit where I'm a member. I'm not a pastor. I travel all the time. But our church family used to do that, and we got busy building a building, and we have a $4.2 million building. We don't do a whole lot about missions anymore. Because we can't afford to. We got a building. We got 125 people coming, $17,000 a month for a building that we did not need. This thing here is not the issue. Well, Randy challenged us. It is what goes on inside this building. Don't you let your love for missions and your love for reaching out, don't you let getting the building or buying property take precedence over there because God will shut you down in a minute. He'll give you a $4 million building. You'll be paying $17,000 a month for nobody coming. Is that what you want? No. Don't forget that. Stay involved in outreach. It, it's costly. It is. I don't just mean financially. It's costly physically. And so don't forget that, okay? Sweet time. Sweet time. Thank you all for letting us be a part. I want to say just a couple of things. Really, I'm going to try. And then I'll quit because I'm hungry too. <laughs> um, in the Bible, there's a lot of building that went on. And I'm not here to be political. But they tell us separation of churches. So you would be an idiot not to understand what our forefathers said. They didn't say the church shouldn't have an influence on government. They said the government should not have an influence on religion. What our government said was stay out of the church's business. And our forefathers, those that weren't even Christian, were not even believers, fell on their knees and called on God to take care of America. To help us keep our eyes focused on the right thing. <coughs> well, there was some building that went on, and there were a lot of entities involved. I thank God. Uh, did you know it's not rare for other churches to be here? As Nikki said, we're thankful that other churches have come. Listen, y'all, we're in this together. Did you know that? Our church family split about 70 years ago, and they started another church, Memorial Baptist. And then Memorial split 10 years ago, 
And they started a church. And I was standing preaching in our big building. And I said, our granddaughter is building right across the road. It was the church that came out of our church. And then this church came out of that church. And I said, would you please tell me what's wrong with our granddaughter church building across the road? I mean, we're in this together, y'all. Friendship is not our enemy. The people down the road are not our enemy. And I'll tell you this. I think it is. Did you know it shouldn't be rare for us to have black and white and Hispanic and whomever in the church of the living God? Amen. Isn't it odd that when people of mixed races get together, we think there's something different about that. We're going to be in heaven together. Did anybody tell you all that? We're in this together. And for goodness sake, we ought to behave like it. I now I don't agree with people that don't preach the gospel. But if he's Pentecostal or a Methodist or Episcopalian, if it means a book, I'm going to worship with him. Don't forget that, okay? But thank you for reaching out. Let me talk to you just a minute about something that they did in the book of Ezra. They were building, and uh, listen to what the king's word was. In the book of Ezra, chapter 6 and verse 7, let me read this verse. Pretty profound. Pretty intact. Somebody said, well, we need to preach on love. Well, sometimes we've got to just lay it out there and preach it straight and hard. <laughs> like you love your child, but you love them so much you're going to make the daylights out of them. He doesn't behave. One guy said, well, they say that this timeout works. You know, stand a child in the corner and practice timeout. I got a Pentecostal preacher friend that said, my daddy practiced knocked out. That worked pretty good for us. <laughs> well, the father, you know about that one, don't you? <laughs> Let me tell you, here, here is a straightforward word. It's rather emphatic. It's found in the book of Ezra when they were going to be building the place to worship, just like you've been building. Chapter 6 and verse 7. Listen to this. Let the work of this house of God alone. Mm. You know what he said? You shut your mouth. <laughs> this was a king. He said, let me tell you something. They're building the house of God and you better not interfere. Yeah. Pretty bad kid. He said, well, Brother Johnny, we want to be... Uh, you know, we love our people and we understand people get all bent out of shape. You better not get bent out of shape. Because you know God knows how to straighten you back up when you get bent out of shape. And did you know in new fellowships, the hardest thing in the world to do is for somebody not to think that they're the one that ought to be in charge. You know what I tell the young couples when I perform their ceremonies? You've always said, well, I wish I, I could do, do it my way. From now on, I'm going to do it my way. And here's what I tell those young, young couples. You're going to give an account to God for this new family that you are beginning. Nobody else is going to give an account to God for it. You are in charge. Did you know as a church family, you're going to give an account to God for what's going on inside these walls? Randy, about 35 years ago, I had the privilege of preaching a dedication message at a church in Poxy, Alabama. Here's what I did. I said to the pastor, Brother Billy, Y'all are dedicating a big, beautiful, nice sanctuary for the glory of God. And is it God's? They said, yes, indeed. And I said, well, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I said, Brother Billy Burke, I'm going to ask you as pastor to come up here and stand in front of this church. And I want you to make a commitment and promise this church family that you will never, ever use this pulpit as a whipping ramp to get back to people because they disagree. I'm going to ask you as a man of God to stand in this pulpit and say, the only thing you will ever hear from me when I stand at this sacred desk is God's Word. I won't give you my opinion. I won't give you my thoughts. I'm going to preach God's Word. Amen. I said, Brother Billy, now, if you're not planning on doing that, don't you lie before these people. And I said, Brother Billy Burge, I'm asking you to come up here and, and you're standing here. I want you to confess to this church. You will never leave, use this place as a place to have your will done. And then I said, I don't have a clue who the deacons are. And I said, I'll ask all you deacons to stand. And they stood. And I said, I'm, I am asking you.
to come up here and stand before this church body and turn around and say to them, I will never stand on this church floor and tell anybody what I think or what my opinion is. I will only stand in this church to represent God and His will. Amen. It's not your church, and you're not in charge. And your opinion is not worth a nickel. It doesn't count. we got to go about what this book says. And I said to those deacons, if you can't stand here and say to this church body, I will never, ever ask this church to vote on anything because of what I think. I'm going to ask them to stick with the book. If you can't do that, you ought to stand right now and resign as a deacon in this church. You say, well, John, that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> You know, they asked me to come back and preach there after that. <laughs> well, well, hey, let me ask you, what's wrong with that? Brother Randy said, if we're not going to do what we say, take the name off of the thing. I mean, we want to make it like you're a church for if you don't behave like it. This is not a place for you to stand up and tell people what you think. You ever been to a business meeting and somebody says, well, I just tell you what I think, well, sit down. We don't care for you. <laughs> Not what I think. And Brother Randy, you and your family be the one who will set the stage for that. Did you know it's hard for a church not to take on the personality of a pastor? Did you know that? It's dangerous. It's dangerous, but it's sweet. Listen to what? Listen to what Ezra said. The king said, let the building of this church alone. In other words, if you have any desire to not let this building alone, you need to take your bag and go somewhere else. Y'all get quiet on that. I'm just telling you the truth. And so the Bible says this situation is so important that even the king said, we got to behave. They're building the house of God. I'm not going to take time to tell you about this, but read that when you get time. And did you know that he said to them, whatever they need financially and whatever building materials they need, he said, you see to it that they have them. And then he said to this, if anybody interferes with the building of this house, you take a timber out of their house. And the reason he said to do that is we want to establish a testimony, a home testimony. He said, if anybody stands in the way of building this work of God, Take a beam out of their home and hang them on that beam. Oh, man. Kind of, kind of hard to understand that is. He said, and people give an offering and they got they got ropes tied on to it. Oh, I gave it. Yeah. I gave the money, yeah, but let me tell you one thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop a speaker here. <laughs> you know what they did? I'm gonna show you. Anybody here that does this? Let me show you. Stay right up here. I'll get to it. Don't worry. Watch this. Anybody here like this? I'm preaching a whole lot of churches. Anybody in here plan on doing this? Watch here. I passed them like this. I'd give my money, preacher, but because I'm a supporter of this church, y'all are going to do things like I say that should be done. Anybody in here plan on doing that? And let me ask you this. Do you realize that has nothing to do with you what you did? Not yours. That's not yours. Right. When you give that into the ministry of God, the fact is, it's God to begin with. Do, are you going to do that in this church family? Or are they going to have to do things? Let me ask you then. Is this music up here? Are we going to have to sing like you want us to sing? Is Brother Randy got to preach like you want him to preach? Are they going to have to do things like for you to be happy and you're going to go to the house and they don't know what you're right? Did you know, can I be honest with y'all? Did you know that's the way it's done most of the time? 
Did you know that's why we got church after church after church after church after church after church starting out of church after church after church after church after church. Why? Because I didn't do it my way. Is that what you plan on doing here? I'm going to put it back. Watch me. I'm going to put it back over there. <laughs> Can I read the scripture to you? What? You are not your own. You're bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus. That's not ours. And I don't care if you give half of what's given in the church. You have no more say so than anybody else. But listen to the impact of this. Let the building of a house of God alone. And if you don't, he said, hang them. That's critical. My, my. And let me read one other thing, dude. Give you a little bit of ease. Somebody tighten up on me. Somebody say, I don't want to make your stuff like that. <laughs> just flip back just a little bit. Let me read this to you. And I'll give you a little bit of good stuff, okay? Look back in the third chapter. And let me read a couple of things to you. Then we'll go. The Bible says in verse 12 of chapter 3, Many of the priests and the Levites and the chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes. Listen to this. Wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy. So that the people could not discern the noise of the about the joy, they couldn't tell the difference of the joy or the noise of the weeping. Why? Because those that had been there and had seen the first house will, because they remembered we've done this before. And we're grieved in our spirit that you might do it again. The news will change that. Do you know who's going to make this church body function like it should so that nobody around here is in charge? You know who will make the decision that God will be in charge here and nobody else? Brother Randy, do you know what I tell the pastors as I travel around in these states? If when this church makes a decision, if a certain person's name comes in your mind more often than others, you are a respecter of persons. It doesn't matter who agrees or who doesn't. If God said it, it's supposed to be done. That's our responsibility. And so, God said through Ezra, all right, it's time to build the church. What are we going to do? He said, what is the opinion? It is this. Whatever it takes to keep your mouth off the building of the church or your hands off the building of the church to deter it, let that be done. Bite your tongues. Bite your attitude. And then one other thing, and I close. In the fourth chapter, listen to this now, in verse 4, after they made the decision, we will build the house of God. In the first verse of chapter 4, Sanballat came to them, and Brother Randy, <clears throat> Ms. Nikki challenged us with this. Sanballat came and said, we know you're going to build. We have seen you are determined. You've got your mind made up. Let us join you. Sanballat said, we will help you build. And the people of God said, no, you cannot be a part of this building. Now, would that be an ugly and mean spirit? No. They knew the objective of Sanballat. Listen to me. The devil will send his emissaries here among you to deter you. Miss Nikki challenged us a moment ago. Listen, it is the devil's business to put the water in the boat to sink us. It's his business to listen to that cause you to anybody in here that's had your feelings hurt since y'all have started at this church family. <laughs> I mean, really, come on now. Sure. I mean, you, you've had, you, you had, you had your feelings hurt? Well, of course you have. Go ahead. Has anybody, have you gotten mad because people didn't say, th say things like you thought they should have been said and they didn't want to do them like you wanted to do them? Of course you have. And Sandbell said, here's our objective. We're going to join forces. You want a bigger building? You want a bigger church family? Don't you dare tie 
up with sandbag for the world. Don't you start doing things like the world wants to do. Because it will cause destruction. And then listen to this. And I close with this. In verse 4. Because the body of Christ said, we don't want the world in here. We, we're not going to do things like the world wants to do. We want ev everybody's welcome. You can come and be a part of this fellowship. Our doors are open. It doesn't matter what color or what belief you have. If you want to hear the gospel and grow in grace, we want you to be with us. We don't care what your background is. If you want to serve the living God, come and join us. But we're not going to incorporate the things of the world. We just can't do that. But when they finally recognize these people need business, don't think the devil's going to leave you alone, Brother Randy. Don't think the devil's going to walk away and say, well, I'm, I'm scared of him. No. Look at verse 4. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah, and they troubled them in building. And they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, the king of Persia. And listen to this. The Bible said they began to make plans to create lies about the people of God. Now, why would anybody do that? Brother Randy, why does anybody, why do the people next door, why do the people down the road, the people at the courthouse, why do they care what goes on here? Why would they lie about what you're doing? It is because the person that you preach is an arch rival. He's the enemy to the world system. Right. That's right. And his name is Jesus. Amen. And so here's our answer here. For all that we do. Whether it's a Pentecostal or a Baptist or an Episcopalian or whomever it may be. If the name of Jesus is proclaimed, then that takes care of it. And what the devil will do, that water that he wants to bring into that ship that Ms. Nikki challenged us about, is a lessening of the land. I've got to meet with the pastor in the days of the not because I'm going to straighten them out, but he violated one of the greatest principles in the Bible. When he stood up the other night and preached, and here's what he said, Jesus got bent out of shape because he had gotten bent out of shape. The pastor was trying to justify his action. He said, Jesus got angry and Jesus got bent out of shape and he, he read some scripture and I, I, want, I, I wanted to say something publicly, but I said, I don't want to rebuke him further. But folks, when you start belittling the Lamb of God, you have begun to undermine the only foundation can any man have, and that is Christ Jesus. And so, when they were building the church, why was he so adamant? Why did he say, if you're planning on deterring what this church is doing, stop it. Hush Quit. Don't be critical. Why? Because what our purpose is is to get the gospel message to this lost world. The people in these grocery stores around here, people who live around here, that the only hope they have is Jesus. He is. Family. You got, you got people in this church body having family problems right now. And the only way for them to rectify their problem is Jesus. Jesus. That's it. I want to emphasize this to you again. <clears throat> you can try to control this church with this and loop your belt around it like I showed you a while ago and hold on to it and say, if I'm going to give, y'all going to do things my way, you can try to handle it that way. Or you can do it with your attitude. You can be so fussy and mean. Have you ever been around these people that are... <laughs> I have. I mean, they, they just... They mean it's the devil. And their attitude are so despicable that they will be so aggressive in their spiteful attitude until they start getting people in the body of Christ to do it their way. If you have intentions on doing that, you better be careful. Because God said, take a beam out of the house and hang it. What a sweet thing to be a member of a new church. So Brother Randy, can I tell you this? All these other churches around here that have been established for 40 years, you need them. You ain't got to think you on God. I mean, you don't know something they don't know. 
You don't know a thing in the world, friends. You're bad. You ain't got an edge on any church around here. It's the same old, same old. But you just got a fresh opportunity to preach the gospel in this location. And Brother Randy, as the, as the leader of this body, reach out. Don't, uh, don't let the name of the church or the way people have treated you or the way you've treated them affect your reaching out to everybody. I read an article by a pastor on Facebook. They make fun of me in my Facebook capacity. I don't care. I'm old. <laughs> uh, I was in El Salvador telling my wife I loved her over Facebook. She didn't reply. <laughs> and then my daughter replied and she said Dad you're not telling mama you love her you're telling everybody in the world you love them I got texts from five nations <laughs> I got a friend in China text me said brother Johnny it's embarrassing but I love you too <laughs> but I can't read Facebook <laughs> and a preacher wrote something on Facebook and he simply said this and brother Randy here's what he said TV Baptist Church might have offended you in times past, and we might have done things that have hurt your family. We might have said things that injured your attitude about this church body. But Brother Darrell said, we want you to know if you will let me know as pastor of this church anything we can do that can bring reconciliation to the body of Christ. Brother Darrell said, I am available to come to your home at any time to see to it that lives are mended. An injured, hurt, broken attitudes are healed so that we can get the gospel of Jesus Christ to this community. Brother Randy, have that attitude. Maintain an attitude that you're just one of us reaching out to others. I want to ask you to buy your head for just a moment. I don't know what place you have in your church, uh, whether you uh, cook the pies or sweep the floors. Or I, When I saw that team just put this beam up, Brother Billy, I, I don't have the kind of building expertise that you do, but when I saw that beam, Brother Volley, being put up, I said, God, thank you for teaching somebody how to build a beam that will hold that wall up so they can widen that sanctuary. If you're the one that finished the sheetrock, look, 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 listen to me now. If you're the one who's had your feelings hurt, are you listening? If you're the one who's had your feelings hurt and you're willing to put your feelings aside so that this church family can go on, that's as important as building that beam to hold up that wall. Are you listening? If you're the one who feels that they really haven't paid attention to your opinion, I am sure. Or if you're the one that has had the strength to make good money to give a lot. Or if you're the one who's given $10 out of sacrifice. Or if you're the one who's had no money to give, but you have been on your face before God, crying out to God, Lord, would you give us strength? Whatever part you have in this body, would you right now say, God, since this is your church, I will be a part of it. Our Father, we, we don't know why you are so loving to us. Our attitudes at times have cut people to the quick. Lord, I know I've said things before to my wife that injured her deeply. Lord, sometimes the money that you put in our bank accounts, we hold and even cherish. Our help, rather than it be a blessing, <coughs> is a means for us to take advantage of others. Lord, this spot beside the road that Brother Glenn said, we never anticipated we could ever meet there. We are in this place today. And Lord, by Your grace, 
You have brought people from walks of life, from so many different places that this church body can grow in grace. We don't want to hold the monies that we give. We don't want to hold our attitudes. We don't want to hold our dispositions and our mouths to say what we choose. But this is your church. Lord, don't let this church become like most others. Don't let them pursue their own goals. But make them unique in bowing down to the King of Kings in everything that they do. In the sweet name of Jesus. So if you would uh, start your heads with me, we're going to say a prayer of dedication uh, this morning. Dedicating this building, but not just this building, but dedicating our lives to the service of the Lord. Uh, there's something to say about anyone who is willing to surrender their lives to the Lord. If there's willingness there, then there's, God is, is going to, to use that individual. There has to be a willingness. And I know it's hard sometimes for most people to surrender anything. I mean, we we get so self-dependent, self-reliant that you know we don't want to we don't want to let go of anything. But God's calling us to let go, and we're not we're not moving into this building for our own purposes. We're moving into this building for God's purposes. And as long as we have our hearts right and in the right place, God will honor. Brother Johnny, thank you so much for your challenge to us today. I mean, we, this isn't something to take lightly. Amen. We have a great responsibility, but we also have a great God. A God who is more than sufficient to supply our every need. Uh, as long as we put Him first and we, we know that the head of this church is Jesus Christ, not Randy Tice. We'll be doing okay. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, we just want to thank you, God, for your many blessings, Lord. We thank you for this new building, Father God, a place to, to fellowship, to worship, Lord, to get together as believers and brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. There's so many benefits to having this, this new location, but God, this is your place, Lord, it's not ours. And I, I pray that we never take ownership of it, Lord. God, that we continually, God, remember that this is your home. This is your place. Lord. And we pray that you use it to your glory. Father, that we would not seek glory for ourselves, but we would seek in glorifying, uh, we'll, we'll glorifying you, Lord, in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, he gave his life for us willingly, Lord. There is no greater gift than that, that gift of grace and mercy that we have received through our faith and belief in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us on the cross. Lord, we are... We are but vessels, Lord, for your use. And uh, I pray, God, that, uh, that today we, we can truly, genuinely give you our lives, Lord, our hearts, our souls, uh, everything that makes us who we are. Father, that we would find our place of truth, surrender to your will and your plan for us, Lord, that we would not uh, seek our own in any way, God, but just seek your will, your plan, and direction, Lord. And, and I know, God, that as we continue to, uh, to have that, that heart and that focus, Lord, that, uh, God, you will honor and bless what is done here. But as soon as we take hold of it, God, I know it, Lord. I know it will fall apart, God. And that's not our intentions, Lord. This building is yours. Our lives are yours. Father God, everything that is done within this ministry, God, is done in your glory. And we just thank you, God, for who you are. We praise you, God, in Jesus Christ's name.